message. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. I would call crucifixion a thing that you suffered. He didn't go to the last minute. He went past the last minute as far as life is concerned, dead, because he believed that God would raise him from the dead. He believed God would raise him from the dead. That's why all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him, Matthew 28. That can't be said of anyone else except in a delegated uh, positionally role there. It's by our position in Christ we've been given this. It's by his delegation of this to us. But who has won it? No one has won it. No one has been strong enough to win it except Jesus Christ. No one could have been strong enough prior to him to win it. And then after that, it's not necessary for anyone to win the war for the whole human, human race. He's already won that. It's impossible. That's why all power in heaven and earth was given to him. Remember, he said that in Matthew 28 after the crucifixion and resurrection. Everything was accomplished. Everything was fulfilled. Now, the only thing that's waiting is I'm going to ascend to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God, John chapter 20, which uh, Satan's not going to try to keep him on the earth. You'll get a black eye every time, you see, keeping him on the earth. So the, con the contest is over because the conquest is in Jesus' hands at that time. It was a crucifixion that mattered, the crucifixion that mattered. Now, we're told in 1 Corinthians 1 just about the crucifixion. It's foolishness, a crucified Jewish carpenter. And to be saved through the preaching and the proclamation of that, it's foolishness. Well, I guess that's Satan again working there. He'll present the world with all of these uh, Las Vegas-type neon presentations of glamour here and glamour there. But just the bare truth, the naked truth, the simple truth, the hard truth, to some people it becomes the boring truth, yeah. is, is essentially the foolishness of the preaching and the proclamation of God's word. Titus 1.3, in due times, he's manifested his word through preaching. Titus 1.3, he's manifested his word through preaching. Preaching is not through signs, it's not through wonders, it's not through miracles, it's through the preaching of the word. And preaching of the word, I mean, it's just a man, it's just words, English, Japanese, French, Chinese, Spanish, something, it's just words. How can that really do anything for anyone? I mean, there are other orators, there are other pop psychologists out there, there are other religionists out there who stand up and talk, and, and you're saying that your word has power and, and all of this? Well, it's foolish to think that, but it's true. <laughs> You know, we'd think, well, give us uh, a blood-red moon or uh, the waves roaring over Chicago, and I don't mean from Lake Michigan, but from the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, now I know that's a sign. <laughs> yeah. The Atlantic Ocean ever covers Chicago. Oh, that's a sign. That, or, or the Indian Ocean, that's even better. That's a sign. The Indian Ocean covering Chicago, surely that's a sign from God. We're going to all repent now. Well, we're told clearly in Scripture in Luke 16 as well as in the book of Revelation, no, men will not repent then. Amen. Luke 16, what's that about? If they don't repent at the preaching of Moses and the prophets, they would not believe though one rose from the dead. And I, he more or less, I mean, that's, we take that and apply that to other things, but what do you think he has reference to? Probably his own crucifixion and resurrection Amen. there. If they don't believe the message I'm preaching, what I'm preaching is based squarely on Moses and the prophets. They won't believe whenever I die and resurrect. And they didn't. What did they say? His disciples came at night and stole away his body. That's right. Sure, he's talking about that. They won't believe, though, one came back to life from the dead. But we can apply that just to signs in general because it's true through the Gospels and it's true throughout the book of Revelation. There's going to come a time where great signs and wonders and plagues are going to befall this earth. And yet John tells us, and yet for all that, they'll not repent. I mean, and, and on the contrary, they'll blaspheme God for sending all these plagues on them. It's not just a passive acceptance of these plagues. And it's certainly not repentance. It's blasphemy against God for sending these plagues. And God's sending the plagues on judgment, but hopefully through the judgment, it'll open the people's eyes and they'll repent and get right with God and see him as a source. They must have seen him as a source of the plagues and judgment. They wouldn't be blaspheming him. But why not see him as the source of the remover of those plagues upon you personally if you recognize him to be the source and repent, therefore, on that basis? They won't. 
They will not. People will not believe just the simple word as it's presented. It has to be accompanied with some type of spectacular display. Some type of spectacular display. We're all in favor of miracles, healings, whatever, whatever God wants to do. But that's not where faith is. That's not where God's word is. Faith cometh by hearing the message of Jesus Christ. And that message is here in his word. Amen. That's how faith comes. Amen. And look at Israel. You think that they had believed if they saw signs? Israel didn't. Nope. Israel saw signs. God said in Hebrews 3, 40 years I worked my miracles and my signs for them. And yet they didn't believe, but tempted me and provoked me in the wilderness. And therefore in my wrath I swore to them they would not enter the promised land. He said, 40 years they saw my works. They saw my works 40 years. They saw Jesus' works three years. The Jews and many Gentiles saw the apostles' work for many decades. Didn't believe the word. Signs and wonders, miracles, they're great, they have their place, but they are always, always inferior to what we're just doing right now and tonight, Amen. teaching the word. Hallelujah. And it can be a donkey that speaks the word, and that's what's important is the word, not the one doing the speaking. Amen. The spectacular signs, they are just added blessings whenever they're there, but they're inferior to God's word. Signs and wonders won't endure for every member. We're told that in 1 Corinthians 13. Though there'll be prophecies, word of knowledge, and tongues, there'll come a day when those three things, as well as all other spectacular things, will cease. But Matthew 5, 17 and 18, my word, though heaven and earth will pass away, my word will never pass away. Amen. Isaiah chapter 40, my word will never pass away. Man will. 1 Peter 1 Verses 23 to 25, he's quoting it there. All the glory of man is like the flower of the field, and it fadeth and passeth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. Isaiah 40 and verse 8 and 1 Peter chapter 2, chapter 1, verses 23 and 25. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. Truth, objectively revealed truth, is the most important thing we can have in life. The most important thing we can ask for is the truth that we have in the word of God. That truth tells us to resist Satan and he will flee from us. That truth informs us who our enemy is. That truth informs us that the basic plague the Christian has in not overcoming Satan, especially the charismatic Christian, is not a lack of knowledge. I don't think knowledge is a question. We know too much. We don't do enough. The plague is spiritual laziness. We don't, as they used to say back in the old days, put up our dukes and fight. We don't fight. In the, in the denominational church, we're more or less kind of convinced, well, you're not told this. Satan is said to be real, but uh, they never really preach sermons on a consistent basis and live their lives. The preachers of this truth, as though he were real. So... Their lives and their lack of preaching on it very much kind of uh, waters down one or two times when they tell us Satan is real, we need to fight against him. That's watered down. So we don't even fight then in the denominational church against Satan. Basically, we don't even fight against him. We don't recognize the importance of prayer against him. For the charismatic, it's prayer in your native tongue as well as in the spirit. We don't ever just, whenever we're under attack in a trial, just get down 15 minutes of good, solid, hard praying in tongues against him to edify ourselves and to pray the perfect will of God in that situation. We just kind of go along and hope things get better, hope things go away in our life. And you know what they generally do? That's interesting. You just give it a day or two and they generally do go away. But then something else comes up. And even though they go away, that doesn't mean you get any marks in heaven for defeating Satan. You didn't defeat him. He just came, attacked you, gave you a bad day, and then left. Remember Matthew 4? He came and then left him for a season. He comes and goes. Satan's not there on your doorstep every day. God help you if he's there every day. He's not on my doorstep every day. Certainly not. There are times he doesn't seem to be around at all, and then all of a sudden there he is. There he is. 
And he attacks in weak moments, not strong. Strong moments. When did he attack Jesus in Matthew 4? Strong moment or weak moment? The end of 40 days, no food. Now, when your resistance, your natural physical resistance is at its lowest ebb, then he attacks. That's when he attacked Jesus. Why is it sometimes it seems like it's first thing in the morning? You're just not together yet spiritually. You're just not there yet. You just wake up and he attacks right then. If you get out of bed with your mind on Jesus, like that song goes, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on him, all of a sudden you're strong when you wake up. There are so many little spiritual tidbits to spiritual warfare they could never be said even if I did teach three and a half hours like I did Wednesday night which I don't plan on doing again tonight they still couldn't be covered then there's so many tidbits yep. why in the morning isn't that true it's in the morning sometimes he's just there in the morning you're groggy and you're just not spiritual you you've just been out of it for eight hours or maybe 12 hours you've just been out of it oh, and and there he is whenever you wake up and so many times, it's, it's those first moments in the morning. If you get off on a right foot, you'll go on a right foot. Amen. The world calls it getting out of bed on the wrong side. Amen. I think it's getting out of bed on either side. <laughs> Just waking up in the morning, there he is, till you resist him. If you wake up with the Lord on your mind, with the Lord in your thoughts... And one of the best ways, well, it does it 100% of the time ensure it, but more times than if you don't do this, that's for sure, one of the best ways is to go to bed with him on your mind. Amen. If you go to bed with him on your mind, maybe he's there subconsciously during your sleep, and then there he is whenever you awake in the morning. Instead of first thing, you think of problems. You think of all the duties and responsibilities of that day. And I think someone in just a psychology class would probably tell you that's not wise to entertain those thoughts first thing in the morning. Not even take into consideration Satan. That's not a good practice personally, individually, to, to have in your life, to meditate on all of your duties and responsibilities first thing in the morning. Because, I mean, they're going to come soon enough as soon as you leave the house or get all the way up, there they are. And so they're going to be there. And so to bring them to yourself five or ten or fifteen or half hour 15 minutes or a half hour earlier is not wise it's just not they're going to be there sooner or later sooner they're going to be there it's not wise to bring them there in advance but beyond just a psychology class who would tell us what not to do you see they don't give us the power they tell us don't think on that well what do you want us to think on then well see scriptures tell us what we should think on isaiah 26 3 that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on the I've always said philosophy has the question. It's always a negative, but they don't have any answers of it. Right. Psychology would, might, might tell you, don't think those thoughts when you wake up in the morning. All right, what should you think? You can't just think, it's a beautiful day out there. Maybe it's not. <laughs> Maybe it's sleeting out there, so that's not valid. Or I'm, I'm so grateful that I have a warm bed. Maybe you didn't the night before, so maybe that's not a valid thought. You've got to think of something beyond just what they're going to suggest, and they really don't suggest anything, because everyone's in a different set of circumstances. Maybe you, you woke up without a warm house, without a roof over your head. Well, you can't think those positive thoughts in. The thoughts you can think of are about God, the Bible, spiritual matters, spiritual warfare, verses, songs, hymns, thoughts, meditation in your mind, past blessings of God future blessings of God, present blessings of God Hallelujah. to encourage yourself to think on him and to overcome Satan and to resist him. Right. Well, let's move beyond the Gospels as we conclude here this evening. Get up into the end of the New Testament. Book of Acts we'll start with. I think I see Satan in the early chapters of Acts. Yeah. <laughs> like in the first chapter, the sixth verse. Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> Trying to get the apostles' mind off the immediate mission of theirs, and that is to receive the Holy Spirit. The important thing now is to receive the Holy Spirit. And so they meet together for 10 days, and Satan 
We're not told all the ways that he tried to stop that. I'm sure there was something done, but I won't even try to read into the text, like maybe there were babies crying in the room and you couldn't concentrate on prayer or something, but I'm sure he was doing something. There wasn't just a passive period in the kingdom of darkness. Here's the birth of the church. Satan recognized what's going on. He hears like all the demons recognize. Jesus has promised to his apostles Wait in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Now, Satan's bright enough to know power, power. That means power against me then. Yep. Now, we're going to find a way to stop this power. So we won't speculate, but he does something to try to stop the power. They receive it anyway. Preach this message. 3,000 people say all oh, they're continuing in the temple, praising God, having favor with God and with men. That's all great. Acts chapter 2, chapter 3 is just great. They heal this lame man. People flock around them. They preach salvation to them. Chapter 4. They're thrown, well, not into prison yet, but they're kept overnight anyway in prison and threatened straightly not to teach or to preach at all in this name, in the name of Jesus. Well, now, what would you have done? Obeyed their threats? I mean, threatening. And it's not like a threat that can't be carried out. You saw what they did to your Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. You know that they can threaten and carry out their threats. But you also, you're, you're so consumed with the fact that nothing can happen but in God's will. That if, if, if that is God's will for them to threaten and carry them out in that manner, then God would just raise up deliverance for his people from some other quarter then. And it wasn't God's will to cause them to be imprisoned and then executed right there to begin with. God's going to get things going. And so it just goes step by step by step. You read 2 Corinthians 11. Paul goes through all of these tremendous, terrible trials of persecution, of affliction, of beatings, of stonings. Satan working against him. I mean, Paul can't, as he is beaten... And then he goes away from that, just think, well, I don't really know what the reason for that was. I mean, there are always, you could say, two different things. There's God's side and Satan's side. God's side, well, it's persecution for righteousness' sake. Praise God, your promised rewards for that. But what about Satan? Satan wants to beat you, get, have you beaten something done to you, so that in your mind you start losing the victory, and in your mind, you start saying, this is not worth it to preach this message of salvation to these people. I think I'll compromise the message. I think I'll adopt a new message. I think I just won't preach anything at all. I'll go back to being a rabbi, or I'll go back to being a tent maker, or I'll make tent making my full-time occupation then. Satan is going to work through episodes like that to weaken us. God's Amen. working through those to strengthen us. Amen. God's ways are unusual ways. To think that you can gain strength through a beating or a persecution? Certainly you can't. God's ways, Satan's ways, what are they directed for? What's his purpose? What is the, the goal, the end result he has in mind? Is your defection from the faith, or at least from that part of it that would cause you to be strong and do what you know that you should do? Let's just defect now. This isn't worth staying here. So we see through book of Acts, we see up into Paul's life, he's in the book of Acts, we see him over in the epistles then, writing about Satan. We read Colossians chapter 2, writing about those, those principalities and powers. We quoted 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the powers of Satan, where he's mentioned personally himself. We've quoted Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, where he's mentioned there. We've quoted and alluded to the verses in Ephesians chapter 6, for he is mentioned, and all of the Christian's armor there. I mean, it's just chapter after chapter, book after book after book. We have to recognize. This isn't, this isn't advocating some, uh, some dark, mysterious framework of thinking you're always to have in that you're always meditating on Satan. Uh, the scriptures say meditate on God, meditate on the word of God. But what's one aspect of his work? And what's that aspect that informs us of the source of our temptations? God tempts no man, James 1. Satan is the one who's behind the temptation. Satan is the one who's behind you not wanting to come to church. God is not behind that. Satan is the one behind you, oh, I just, I'm just too tired to pay any real attention now. Satan is the one behind that. That's right. We dare not 
We cannot afford the luxury of just explaining things on a natural basis. Well, I'm sleepy. Well, that's fine. <laughs> but still, Satan is the one working through that. You want a good yeah. example? Acts 20. What did Satan call through the sleepy character of Eutychus? He called us his death. Amen. His death. God didn't kill Eutychus. Satan killed him. But what was the cause for it? He was sleepy. Paul was long time in preaching that night. It was his last night with them. Long time in preaching. And Eutychus fell down from the window of the third store and they took him up dead. And Paul went down and laid on him and said, be of good comfort, his life is in him and raised him from the dead. There's a good example of what Satan will do. Amen. Satan will get in and sow these seeds of discord like in the church in Corinth and, you know, everyone claiming a party. We're of this party, we're of that party. The basic theme of of first corinthians as you well know is the misapplication of christian liberty you find throughout it this this claim of the corinthians we are free we are free they had false notions of grace at corinth we are free we are free evidently paul in making reference in chapter six and and later in chapter 10 to that phrase all things are lawful Evidently, he's quoting a slogan, a current slogan among the Corinthian church. All things are lawful. I think the NIV will even put it in quotation marks as. And that's an interpretation, but it seems to be a valid one because it appears to be uh, a quotation. He's quoting them of what their philosophy is. All things are lawful, a false notion about grace. And Paul says, man, that's not exactly true. All things are lawful. Fornication is not lawful. Incestuous relationships with your stepmother are not lawful. Yeah. Factions in the church are not lawful. Not wearing the head covering is not lawful. Speaking in tongues without interpretation in the church is not lawful. Lawsuits is not lawful. I mean, he goes step by step what is not lawful. They're saying all things are lawful. We're free in Christ. He says you've misinterpreted the doctrine of Christian liberty and Christian freedom. Look at there what the devil did with... With, with the correct truth, we're free in Jesus Christ. I mean, that's what the message of the cross is about. You're free. If, you're my if you continue my word, you're my disciples indeed. You'll know the truth. The truth will make you free. They misinterpreted that, though. Galatians, the church at Galatia, and the Christians there, seeds of Satan sown in their midst. Paul writes a good letter, 1 Thessalonians, they misinterpret it by Satan. He has to write a second letter, 2 Thessalonians, to correctly interpret that. He even prophesies in his own sermon in Acts chapter 20, Satan is going to work through people outside of this church here at Ephesus and even those inside to sow seeds of division and compromise, to water down the truth, to bring into error and heresy, and to cause people to fall away from the truth and be made disciples of other men instead of Jesus Christ and those who are teaching the truth. Chapter by chapter by chapter by chapter. He says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul himself says, Satan hindered me. I was going to come unto you at Thessalonica and Satan hindered me once and again. Something of that order, although not so uh, it's not mentioned so directly and personally there. It's seen over in Romans chapter 1 and Romans 15. He was hindered by other things, but still Paul was hindered in getting to Rome there. Although I don't think it's, you can direct it to Satan as much as you can the case in uh, 1 Thessalonians 2 because he mentions Satan there. Book of Hebrews, Hebrew Christians. I mean, people think the New Testament just filled with nothing but glory and truth. The epistles, most of them, were written to combat some misconception about God. It's not like everybody had the truth in and they had no problems in the first century church. We wouldn't have a need for Galatians without those problems. We wouldn't have a need for 1 Corinthians without those problems. We wouldn't have a need for 2 Thessalonians without those problems. We wouldn't have a need for Colossians written against the Gnostic heresy or 1 John or 2 John written against those who deny the doctrines of Christ or Revelation chapters 2 and 3 because of these six of the seven churches now are compromising the truth and watering things down there. No need for the book of Hebrews. No need for the book of James if people weren't failing to recognize that faith without works is dead. No need for all of that. Sure, they had problems. What was the source of their problems? The same source as the source for our problems, that Satan himself 
either personally or most of the time, 99% of the time, working through demons or the demons work through people or through circumstances. It's either Satan or his forces, demons, working in your mind to sow these thoughts of, of, of falling away from God or of wondering if you are falling away from God or of compromising your allegiance to him, of making it difficult to, as the old Pentecostals say, pray through or praise through and reach God or touch God making it difficult sometimes there's just a heaviness around Amen. and that can't just be overcome by saying well praise the lord just overcome it Amen. i mean mentally spiritually you have to concentrate on what you're doing talk to satan as though he's real talk to him as though he's alive Amen. talk to him as though he is a personal entity and foe Amen. and talk to demons as well and you see we charismatics are known for that non-charismatics are not known for that but what you'll find many times is whenever you're just given an abundance of truth in a certain area or about a specific topic, you tend to take it for granted then. And it just becomes a, a little catch-all thing. I rebuke the devil. Now, I never rebuke the devil as a, as a Presbyterian. I rebuke the devil. Or, demon, I command you to leave me alone in Jesus Christ. Wow. We just kind of think, well, I just rebuke demons. And it's like a demon is just like a non-entity like haze vapor smoke oxygen something invisible it's not like this is a personal foe of mine daniel 10 is very clear a personal foe withheld the answer for daniel's prayer for 21 days the prince of persia withstood the archangels of god from coming and giving him the answer to his prayers for 21 days. You don't think they would try to hinder your prayer, confuse you? You see, generally, if Satan can confuse you, you've got influence on other people. Amen. And if he can confuse you, he'll confuse others through you. Amen. That's why it's best, if you're ever confused, just to keep your mouth closed about it. Amen. Psalm 73 teaches that, by the way, if you want a verse. This man over there is pretty concerned, Asaph, about, I believe he's the author of that, about the prosperity of the wicked. Oh, said, seems like they're always prosperous and the righteous don't have anything. But he said, I didn't open my mouth lest I offend the children of God. Essentially, I'm paraphrasing. If you get down to, I don't know, I have to look it up and I don't want to take the time, but verse 10 or 11, somewhere down there, about halfway through Psalm 73 that I didn't say it to the children of God's people lest I offend them. In other words, it would have caused them to stumble to begin to express all of your confusion and all of your doubt about various things. The best thing to do is just be quiet. Oh, Satan is going to try to work through you because he knows you have influence on other people. Right. You've got influence on other people. And so the answer is not just be quiet and therefore just remain confused yourself. But be quiet while you are throwing Satan, demons, and their confusion off of you. You can't just passively just be quiet. You just stay confused then. But while you're quiet, uh, as far as sharing your confusion with other people, then be conquering him. Be defeating him. He's the one who brings in heaviness in your life, heaviness in your spirit. I mean, unless it's God really trying to warn you or show you about something, it's that evil, wicked heaviness that, that, that turns your mind away from God, turns your heart away from Him. We can't, just, we can't think that uh, it's always because so many times in Scripture, you know, He's portrayed as personally coming through a demon or perhaps Himself, which would be, I mean, uh, personally proper Him coming. Just because sometimes in Scripture it is seen that way, we can't think, well... These thoughts of mine, I can't trace those back to Satan then. First Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 1, Satan moved David to number Israel. The Samuel account says he did, meaning God. First, Samuel 20, First Chronicles 21 and verse 1, Satan moved David to number Israel. I wonder how he moved him. Do you think he came to him and stood in his court? I bet it was in his mind. Amen. He put the thought in his mind to count the number of his armies and it showed a lack of faith in God. Now, there's a good scripture right there. 
And the best one we really have available, we just dealt with. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3, 4, and 5. That you have to cast down imaginations, arguments, wicked thoughts, pretense, false knowledge that lifts itself up against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity what? Every thought. Satan works in the realm of the thoughts, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Now listen, if you don't do that, A, you're disobeying God, and B, you're just opening yourself for a further fall at the hands of Satan. You're just, you're just sowing your own seeds and planting your own crop there for future devastation. Not only in disobeying God, but in allowing Satan to remain there. So I think we have conclusively proven just by the Holy Spirit tonight mm -hmm. from every aspect of every portion of Scripture that we're in a warfare, mm -hmm. that it's not you and Satan, it's God and Satan he has privileged you, he has privileged you to, to, to be inducted into his army. It's just a little small mechanism somewhere that's part of the whole. And you're privileged to fight on the winning side Amen. and on God's God. side. You're privileged to be there. You're, it's a fight for truth. It's a fight for morality. It's, it's a fight for all uprightness. For the continuation of this. And on God's side, you're privileged to be there. You're, it's a fight for truth. It's a fight for morality. It's, it's a fight for all uprightness, whether it's moral, physical, financial, spiritual, all soundness, all peace, all wholeness. It's a fight for that. It's a fight between God and Satan. Satan is the one who brings in uh, spiritual corruption, moral corruption, domestic turmoil, financial troubles, physical ailments. Acts chapter 10, remember, Jesus went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Between, it's, it's a fight between God and Satan over soundness, peace, wholeness. That's what peace, remember, means in the Old Testament. It's, it's completeness in every area of your life. That's what you basically had in Genesis 1. Peace reigned on the earth. Everything was whole and complete and sound. And it's not been that way since then. Yeah. And it won't be that way in your life until you do what God tells us that we should do. So we've proven from Scripture, and then you can go all the way through. We haven't even covered everything. 1 Peter 5 talks about Satan. James 4 talks about him. You can jump over into Revelation. Chapter 12 talks about him. Way over into Revelation chapter 20, and there's the last reference to him. All of Scripture says this is what's going on. You're, it's not you battling some computer, or you battling an employee, or you battling whatever. It's the forces of God against the forces of Satan. God, God himself generally uh, doesn't move off the throne and come down to do anything. He came down historically in Jesus Christ to do what needed to be done. The angels are fighting against the evil angels of Satan all the time. Contests that uh, we know nothing about as far as seeing them or feeling them or having first-hand knowledge besides through the word about what's going on there. But that's taking place. Daniel 10 is a good example. But then you get it right down here on the human level. Now it's not you against a lost person. Now it's you back all the way to the top of their chain of command because of James 4, 7. Resist your lost next door neighbor. Resist a demon. No, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Amen. Now it's you all the way back to the top of their chain of command. It's the Christian against Satan as Ephesians six ten portrays it, fighting in the might and in the power of the Lord. So we demonstrate that can be easily proven in Scripture. What can be proven, moreover, is the fact that we're fighting a battle whose outcome has already been determined. Praise God. Amen. The victory has already been won. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 57 and 58. Thanks be unto God who gives me the victory through my Lord Jesus Christ. It's something that's already been won. That means, therefore, 
It is a matter of enforcing the victory. That means, therefore, it is a matter of spiritual fortitude versus spiritual laziness. We've already proven who you're fighting against. It's Satan. We've already proven he's already been defeated. We've already proven it's nothing but a matter of enforcement. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. What does it boil down to here in the final analysis? You've got to do something about it. Spiritual fortitude and vitality, your strength spiritually, and your desire to take the initiative and to be strong in your life and to pray and to seek God and to read the Word and quote the Word and memorize the Word and meditate on the Word and use the Word against Satan. That versus not ineptness on a person's behalf. God has, has adapted you to spiritual warfare and saving you and filling you with the Spirit. But spiritual laziness, lack of concern, spiritual apathy, dog days of summer type spiritual existence where it's just too difficult to do anything about this. Here you are, you're standing in here, and it's worship time, and you just don't feel like worshiping God. And it's just, it's kind of like nothing is, it's just not reaching him. Well, maybe you need to resist Satan vocally and, and mentally and personally. I command you to leave me alone. I command this depressing spirit to leave me and be gone right now. Our resistance many times is a poor substitute for resistance. Because the scriptures say if you resist, he'll flee. I like the way it says that we haven't even looked at it yet, but I guess we all can quote it. If you resist him, he'll flee. I like the way it says that he'll flee. You'll put him to flight. I hope you recognize that's no small thing now. He's the one who's ruled nations and conquered kingdoms. Amen. Hallelujah. The word of God says, if you resist him, he'll flee from you like a, well, we call people like that chicken. I don't mean to be disrespectful to Satan. We're just saying what the scriptures say about him. If you resist him, he'll flee. Flee. Is he afraid? He's the author of all fear. You better believe he's afraid of you and he's afraid of the word of God that's Amen. on your lips. Praise God. Amen. He, has to, he has to be. He's not just impervious to that. That matters to him when you have faith and strength, when you have the word of God dwelling on your lips. It's in your heart, Colossians 3.16, richly abiding there. Therefore, it's easy to be on your lips in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and just in confessions of faith against Satan and about God. You see, the charismatics have ritualized it too much for us. I don't like, I don't go for the rituals too much, but I go for the reality of it. I don't want, I don't want a list of four things to say 8.7 times a day. I just want the word and it to be on my lips, confessing the word, reading the word, confessing the word, talking about the word. I don't want the ritual and the formula of it, but we can't just say because we don't have the ritual and the formula, that means we won't say it at all then. I'm going to say, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I want to say, but my God shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I want to confess that. I want to believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, Savior, Deliverer of my life. He's Lord, Savior, Deliverer. That means I have total deliverance in my life. I think I ended just in sharing with you the other night. Go thinking Jesus Christ is my Savior. Well, look how that applies to what we're studying tonight. He has saved you from all of the forces of darkness, delivered you from all of the powers of darkness, delivered you from that kingdom. And now it's a matter of enforcing it, which means it's a matter of doing something about it in your own life. People are just spiritually lazy. That's why they don't accomplish anything. They're just satisfied. Well, I'm doing okay, and no, I'm not being blessed over here, and I don't really know why, but after all, I'm not being blessed over there either, and I'm working over there instead of over here. Well, you better work in both areas. Amen. <laughs> if there's a lack of blessing in both areas, you better work in both areas then. 
Uh, we, and we, we sometimes come along and say this, and you, you see we're emphasizing a different point tonight, that you might, have, you might have to rebuke the devil less often if you'd praise God more often. And I don't doubt there's truth to that, that you'd have to rebuke Satan less if you'd praise God more. Just God would be dwelling in your praise so much Satan wouldn't be coming around. But that's not 100% true, though. You can praise God 24 hours a day. And Satan's going to be there anyway, sometime or the other. Jesus lived in the perfect will of the Father. That didn't mean Satan didn't come and tempt him, though. He came anyway. Oh, I'm a firm believer in the fact if you praise God more, bless him more, express your thanksgiving and gratitude to him more, you'll have to rebuke Satan less. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't mean that you just have the cessation of the need of combating him mm -hmm. entirely in your life. Mm -hmm. He's going to be there. And I don't want to water down the message of resisting Satan by saying, well, let's just praise God all the time, all the time, all the time. That's great. That's only part of the message, though. It's only part of the message. Resisting Satan is another very, very strong part. The outcome is clearly told to us in James 4 in verse 7. If you resist him, he will flee. And why we have such need of a resistance is clearly told to us in 1 Peter 5. He goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And even Peter goes on to say, therefore resist him steadfast in the faith. He didn't tell us that he'll flee, but that's the implication, and James fills it in for us. James said, just resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Peter said, therefore resist him steadfast in the faith. Hey, he happens to give us some more clues on how to resist. And that's just what I've been preaching here without even thinking of that. It's resisting him, not with spiritual laziness. That's no resisting. It's a poor substitute, if anything. Resist him steadfastly. Resist him in the faith. Resist him in faith and do it steadfastly. 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. Resist him in the faith and resist him steadfastly. He'll go. And what this boils down to is back to what I hope to get into a series one of these days on the parable of the sower over there is Matthew 4 and verse 4, the importance of the word. Because what we're saying here, all that we've taught, is taught by the word. And that means you give glory to God and the word in doing what he has said to do in the Bible. You bring it to, to pass in your life. You see, he said resist the devil and he'll flee. That's true. But that doesn't do anything just sitting there in the book of James, though. It's just sitting there. It takes enforcing. You fulfill the word of God. You show God to be faithful. You show his word to be true and reliable and correct in every area of your existence. Whenever you do what the word says and you watch the results come to pass. Amen. And the doing is resisting and the results are and he'll flee. Amen. And he will flee. We have to know biblically who he is, what he is, how he comes, how to resist. Well, we've kind of given you a, a whole bird's eye view of all of that tonight. You. You're going to more detail on that, obviously. But if you're a charismatic Christian, you know enough about the devil. You don't have to see him in a red suit to recognize him. But you do have to have instruction, or many times it's kind of it becomes vague in your mind who Satan really is, where he is. Is he really working against me? I haven't detected any work against me. Boy, I've just been blessed recently and things have gone my way. Well, we could answer that with one of two statements. Maybe you, you were attacked in some of those blessings you just didn't recognize it, or many times it's back to Matthew 4. He left him for a season. You've been blessed of God for the last week. That means your season for temptation has not yet come. It's going to come on another day when something goes wrong with you. Everything has gone perfectly for you. Our sister gave this testimony. I could list, I know, if I just wanted to think about it, but I don't want to say some of the things because they're so personal and specific. I could list 30 things just in the last week or two that have just gone perfectly right in my life, right down to, you know, going out and shopping, and you just need this, that, and the other, and they're just there, 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 there. And it's the last one each time. You pick up the last one they have. That's a blessing from God. You know what? That didn't always happen, though. Go to the store looking for what it is you want, and you can't find it. You go to another store. It's not there. 
-hmm. You see, that happens. That hasn't been happening to me lately, so I'm going to be on my guard now. <laughs> a, after all the blessings I just have received, and B, after this teaching tonight. Amen. I'm going to be on my guard. You see, every little thing has just been going perfectly right. I mean, down to just very, very small personal things. Just God arranges your whole day where everything Amen. goes well for you. But that doesn't always happen, though. There are times he allows Satan to come in, or there are times that we allow him to by disobedience or a lack of guarding ourselves behind and before below and above and on both sides and he comes in and starts trying to work adversely in our life then it's time to start resisting i mean you really can't you really can if you're in just great blessed times of your life you can't just sit there saying i resist you satan that, that doesn't serve any purpose at all those are times to be you know meditating on something else you don't need to do any spiritual warfare you, see, you don't fight someone until they're there to fight whenever they're there then they're there do you realize some demons fight harder than other demons? Now that's kind of difficult for our sophisticated computerized minds to handle today, but you better believe it's true. They are personal entities. There are different levels of demons, just like there are different levels of people right here in this building tonight. Some of them fight harder than others. Some of them are, are specialists at certain areas of your life. Sometimes Satan has more plans, more evil concoctions that he's devised against you than at other times. Sometimes just one or two things are thrown at you and you just rebuff those right away and you're on your way to victory. Mm -hmm. Other times he throws a couple, you rebuff those, he throws two more, you rebuff those, he throws two more, you rebuff one of those, he throws two more, you rebuff half of one of those, he throws two more, and you don't rebuff any, he's got you now. Sometimes he doesn't fight like that. Sometimes it just seems like it's continuous. It's going day after day after day. He's resisting you. He's fighting against you. I guess I'm reminded also of another point I don't want uh, to leave without saying lest the message be incomplete. And that is 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Sometimes when you've sinned, you've been turned over to Satan. Maybe not in such a judicious, judicially manner as you have in 1 Corinthians 5, where it's been done by the apostle and the church at Corinth, but you've just opened yourself up to Satan. And therefore, just to fight and fight and fight and resist and resist and resist all the time is not the answer. The answer is to repent and do the first works, get straight in your life what God is concerned about, and then resist Satan, and then he'll flee as a result of that. Because I know of cases where people have just thought the thing to do is fight against Satan, and really it's God after them. Hebrews 12, he's chastening them. And you can't fight against Satan and cause God to leave you alone. Mm -hmm. If God is the one chastening you, Hebrews chapter 12, which is a quotation from Proverbs chapter 3, or 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Or 1 Timothy chapter 1. You have many cases of that. You can't fight against Satan and throw off the yoke of God's chastisement. It's really not a yoke. It's a rod of discipline that he's trying to correct you by. And sometimes it comes through the fact that, well, you've just kind of been sailing along, not good or bad in your life. And so Satan moves right in. God allows him to move right in to awaken you to the fact you've got to be on your guard spiritually. Amen. You're failing to do what you should have been doing all along, be on your guard. Now you've really fallen. And I've said many times, some of these statements are kind of like um, uh, old proverbs or something that need to be said so much. Uh, one of those is our need for the Word of God. Another of those is the battle is won or lost in the mind. Another of those is give the devil a moment and it'll take a day to get rid of him. That's just the way that it works. You give him a little time in your mind and it'll take more time to get him out than it took for him to enter in. It'll take more time. It's just the way that it works in spiritual matters. I've said before, for some reason, it seems so easy to lose good things, just to lose them, and and to and to gain the reverse of that. 
It's just like you fall into it. <laughs> you don't fall into truth, but you fall away from truth, though. Yeah. Truth, you have to strive to enter into the kingdom of God. But to enter into Satan's kingdom, just don't do anything. It's easy to enter into his kingdom. But it, to enter into God's, it takes more spiritual fortitude. You have to have your biblical vitamins daily there to be strong enough to overcome Satan then and to grasp truth. Truth, we're going to see in the parable of the sower. You already know. If you just leave it lying there on your mind, just on the top of the soil, Satan comes. He's the bird that snatches it away. It takes, okay, I'm going to think about this. I'm going to think about this. I'm going to think about this. I'm going to meditate this right down into my heart because I know if I get it down in my heart and it starts producing fruit, then Satan can't touch it. But the scriptures say he can touch it whenever the sower sows the word, the word exists right on the top of one's mind and you don't do anything about it and you don't understand it. You don't understand it. One of the par one, in one of the gospels, the interpretation of that is that the seed is sown and the person doesn't understand. And so the wicked one comes and takes that word that was sown in his heart. Well, it didn't really reach his heart, but that was the intent of it, though. And sometimes just on the way home, by the time you get home, the word's already been stolen. Amen. I should meditate on the word and make sure I realize Satan is the foe. Satan is the foe. Okay, Lord, it's impossible for me right at this moment as I'm going home or I'm getting up the next day to remember everything that Pastor Rawls said last night in that teaching, but what was the theme of all of it? Satan. All right, Satan. I'm not, I can't forget that now. I'm going to remember that Satan is against me. I'm going to start resisting him in my life. You may not remember all the details, but what is the theme of what has been shared, though? Amen. It brings it to the forefront of our mind. Amen. And it's brought to the forefront of my mind because that's what the Lord wanted us to look at tonight. I had some other things prepared. I'm standing up here on the front row ready to teach, and I don't have a thing jotted down for this. But this is what is for us now. Praise God. <laughs> to remember <laughs> Satan's power, to remember how he works against us, to look back on what has happened in this body, and remember, he is the one who has done all this. Yeah. I, I've explained it like this to, to another sister. and Maybe it would be good if you heard this explanation. There's, there is a difference, if you listen to my terminology, between God's will and what God wills. There's a difference between God's will and what God wills. Because I've said it this way. And, and you don't have to use that terminology all the time, but if you're using a different form of words, you have to understand what you mean by what you say or what someone else means by what they say. I, I, I've said, well, praise the Lord. We don't have certain people around here anymore. A sure Satan is the one who has caused them to fall away from truth. And I'm not just equating falling away from this church with falling away from truth, but after all, if the truth is here and you leave it, I mean, why would you leave it then? I don't see any other reason. Why would you leave it if you believe that you're receiving the truth here? But praise the Lord, the Lord's will has been done. Mm -hmm. Because you see, God's will is whatever he accomplishes. That is what he wills to do. But God's will for you is his desire for you, the perfect will of God in Scripture for you. And his will is that you never fall away from truth, that nothing ever bad like that happens to you. There's a difference between God's will. See, God's will for me Let's, now, let's take, it, let's take it a different way. God's will for member X of this church who is no longer here, God's will for that Christian brother or sister, God's will for them was that they remain here. But God evidently, you have to say this, but God willed for them to leave. They couldn't if God didn't will it. It's impossible for something to catch God by surprise or for something to happen that God hasn't already predetermined and foreordained. But I'd say that's why I've told people, and it's been difficult for them to understand, and so I try to explain to one sister, surely it is God's will for you to remain here in this church. But if he doesn't will that for you, then that means you won't stay or remain. Or if I was talking to someone who's not here anymore, then it would be, and that's why you're not here anymore. You see, we can see Satan in that, 
with him causing the person to fall away and not see the truth, love the truth, want the truth, desire the truth, pan after the truth like they did at one time. But then after all, maybe there's even a higher purpose than just that little individual getting the truth. And maybe the higher purpose is God wants his whole body here to grow more, to prosper more, to be more blessed. And the only way to have that happen is to have some people not here anymore. You see, I see even a higher will of God right there because it involves a whole group of people. We have to remember how Satan works, but how God, if, if the people are of God and doing his will, he's going to get glory out of everything that happens as a result of that. With, with the recent things that have happened and things that are going to happen in the church, we can't just take like some people do well, anything, if, it hap if something happens negative about this, I'm sure that must be God telling me that this is not the thing to do. Well, maybe that's Satan trying to, trying to get you to doubt that that is God's will for you. You know, some people are looking for a sign, a double confirmation. You know, Lord, if, if you want me to have this job here, then, and you set a certain condition there, if you want, if God, if you want me to have this job, then let this be the starting pay whenever I go, or, or just give me a beautiful interview whenever I go. And so whenever you go, you just have a terrible interview. Maybe that's not God trying to tell you something. Maybe that's, try, that's Satan trying to get you away from that job because he knows that job is God's will for your life then. We have been instructed to interpret things on a wrong basis. Everything, if it's of God, it has to be good. Everything has to work out. It has to be positive. If it's of Satan, everything is wrong then. Well, Satan came and offered Jesus the kingdoms of the world. That's pretty positive. And all the glory of them. That's pretty positive. You can't just base things on that. You can't base things on that at all because Satan will come and offer something good whenever it's not God's will. And whenever it is God's will... He'll bring discouraging circumstances to surround that. And then you begin to question yourself and say, oh, God must not be in this venture at all. Because if God were in this venture, surely he'd be blessed. Well, it will be eventually if he's in that venture. It will be blessed eventually. It may not be right now. It may be at the time where you have to discern, now is this God and you have to seek him on this. Is this God trying to steer me away? Or is it Satan trying to steer me away? Someone's trying to steer you away. Amen. If you start a new venture in life and you've got a lot of discouraging circumstances to begin with. Either God or Satan is trying to steer you away. Let's turn that around. You're starting a new venture in life. You've got lots of positive circumstances about it now. That's either God or Satan encouraging you. It's another matter of discernment there. Satan could be saying, oh, this is it. Look at all these things that have happened right. This job, this venture, this project just fell into place perfectly. That may be suspect. That's not a test. <laughs> not in the final analysis. That's not a test whether that's God's will or Satan's will. That's no test at all. That's the false way we have been taught to interpret things. We have to interpret things by the word and by the inner testimony of the Holy Spirit, not by looking at the circumstances. Now, the inner testimony of the Holy Spirit may point us toward those circumstances. When you're asking the Lord, now, Lord, is this of you? And the Holy Spirit witnesses to your heart, well, look what I've already done for you here. And you say, oh, yes, you have already done this. Okay, and I'm going to take that as as an encouragement to go on and, and move full steam ahead in this venture. But you have to be careful. You have to beware. You can't just look for positive things and say it's of God and evil and say it's of Satan. God may work through the evil to turn you away from something or Satan may work through the good and lead you to something that's simply not of God. Just because there are positive results doesn't mean anything at all. Just because everyone around you is encouraging you to do that doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. doesn't necessarily mean that it's God's thing for you to do at that time. You're going to have to listen to the Holy Spirit. And I think in saying that, we're back to spiritual laziness. It's a lot easier not to have to really pray and listen. And I mean pray with the intent of him speaking to you and you hearing him about it. Now, he may not pray, he may not answer you 
so that you perceive his answer on Thursday. You prayed on Thursday. Mm -hmm. But maybe he's going to answer you on Friday, the next time you pray about it. Or the next week that you bring it up to him. Or the next month that it is brought up to him. I mean, I could, you see, with certain circumstances about my schooling, I could take those as signs of God saying, that's not my will for you. Have I thought about it? I certainly have, but I'm convinced. What am I convinced on? I'm convinced on the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, not on anything external. If I look around at some externals, I'm discouraged. That's not the best thing to do. And it probably is not going to work. Look what's happened in the church. Look what's happened over here. Now, you see, I have to be discerning enough to know, all right, now, who's speaking here? Why do these things happen to encourage me or discourage me? Who's working through these evil things, God or Satan? God trying to warn me, don't do this. Satan trying to get me off of something he knows is God's will, perfect will, and that he's going to lose more territory through if, if I or if you, whatever we're talking about, if I accomplish it. I'm going to have to listen whenever my former pastor tells me now, don't move to Minnesota because here's our financial fact sheet on our recent trip to Maryland and here's what you're going to lose if you go. Now, is that God? Could be God. Could be the devil. I think it was the devil that time. <laughs> you know, you can look back on them, but you also have to be able to look at them right then. And I looked at it right then and thought, that's not of God. What I go on, what I believe the Lord wanted me to do. I didn't feel it was contrary to Scripture. It was, in, it was in line with Scripture. But again, I didn't have a verse that said, Cheno de Lee Ross, born in January of 59, is on this date, August of 1980. I have planned for him to move to Minnesota. I'd love for that to be in Leviticus somewhere. I'd rather for it to be in Matthew. It's easier to find for some people. I'm fairly familiar with that book as well. Oh, I'd love a verse like that. Wow. Praise God. But you know what? Another part of me would say, no, I wouldn't want a verse like that. It makes it too easy then. Just too easy if you can go ask your spiritual pope or bishop, now, should I cut my toenails today or not? What's God's will? I just can't make up my mind. They're a little bit long, but they could wait until tomorrow. Is it God's will or not? People have their most ridiculous questions about the most ridiculous topics in life. But I don't know. If you're cutting hose to your socks, that may be an important subject to you. Especially if you're low on money and you can't afford new socks. But no, that makes it too easy. What you want to do is listen to the Lord. 